We're going to read today from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 to 32. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labour, do honest work with his own hands, so that, me, so that he may have something to share with anyone. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that he may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. It's quite a list, right? But I tell you what, if you want to know what it looks like to live a life of righteousness as we're called to, this is very helpful. And if you want to know what it is like to be holy as God is holy, then this list puts a little bit of meat on the bones of what that looks like. It's not, of course, exhaustive, which is probably a good thing, I imagine, because this on its own is a lot. It's a challenge. One of the things I would really like for us to pick up on is the fact that with each of the instructions are, in fact, two things that need to be done. If you read them again, you'll see that there is something to put off and something to put on. That is, there's something we're to no longer do and something which we are to do. So we put off falsehood and instead speak the truth in love. We let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths, but instead we speak only what's useful for building others up. So then we're to put to death everything that is unlike Jesus, and we are to put on or develop all the graces and characteristics which reflect Jesus. As we do that, we're going to be transformed more and more into his image and likeness. It's really important for us to understand this because we do need to grow in holiness. We need to grow in Christ likeness. But that doesn't just mean doing things which are righteous or which reflect Jesus. We actually won't progress in holiness until we first put away or put to death our old sinful ways. So simultaneously we put away the old life and put on the new. You need to think about that. Consider these verses, what it says to us, because we do need both. On one hand, if all we do is put away the old, well, that's not the same as growing to be like Jesus. We also need the new life, the things the Spirit works in us. And on the other hand, we cannot positively grow to be like Jesus without rejecting the lingering and habitual sins of our old life. That would just be like planting flowers in a garden infested by weeds. And so we simultaneously put on and put off. We put off our old sinful way of living and then put on righteousness, the ways that reflect Jesus. Sinclair Ferguson uses the terms displacement and replacement, which is perhaps helpful for some of us. And so as we get into the verses themselves, we can see the things we're to put off and the things we're to put on. First of all, in verse 25, we're to put away falsehood. So that means there should be no lying. But not only that, there should be no pretense or hypocrisy because they also are false. And we do so, and we're given a reason why, because we are one body. We're united to one another. And those we're united to, we cannot be false with them. Because we're members of one body, so when we lie to them or are fake or are hypocrites, we act against the body and it cannot function as it should. Verses 26 and 27, it doesn't actually tell us to put off anger. So it does suggest there could be righteous anger. What we are told is that our anger should not last beyond the day. Basically, our anger cannot dominate us or become an obsession. If it does, then most likely that means that anger is not righteous. And I think so few Christians know what it means to have righteous anger. And instead, what we find is we sin in our anger. We're critical to people either directly or simply in our minds towards them, or we speak to others or act towards them out of our anger. If it's a situation in church, our anger about something said or done that we disagree with, can lead to us then sinning as we undermine leadership or other individuals. 
we gossip, we backbite, we say things against them. And so often we believe we are right, but rather what we're angry about is a matter of our own opinion or our preferences being agreed. I think it's a real work of the spirit to be able to see this and recognise this even before we get to dealing with it in our heart. And Paul's great concern, understand this, his great concern about this anger is that if anger does rest on us, it gives the devil a foothold. Surely we don't want that. Next then it says we're not to steal, but rather do honest work with our hands. And God's desire is not that we simply do not steal, but as we see with Jesus throughout the Gospels, he goes beyond the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. So it's not enough that we just don't steal. Rather, we are to be generous. We should be sharing what we have with those in need. And so the goal of this command is generosity. In verse 29, it says, let no corrupting talk come out of our mouth. And again, we see the two sides here. We might think, OK, I've got a job to do in regards to being careful what I say. But even if we mastered that, the thing we have to put off, if we mastered that, the aim is not simply to stop cursing or being critical or lying or deceiving with what we say. We are to then ensure that only what comes out of our mouth is useful for building others up. So we put off and we also put on. And actually, the thing about this is this is an attitude of our heart. In Luke 6, 45, we read that from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we have a new heart. We have a new identity in Christ. So where we can concentrate on our heart and being with Jesus, from there, out of that, will flow this good speech. Verse 30 and 31, we can grieve the Spirit of God and we can do that even as we speak. You think of Israel in the desert criticising and complaining. And bitterness and anger, wrath, clamour, slander, all these things that are listed in verse 31, these all grieve the Spirit. Because when any of these things are prevalent in our life, we are living contrary to the Spirit who lives in us. When the fruit produced is not of the Spirit, but rather of our sinful nature, the Spirit is grieved. Instead of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour, slander, we are to be kind to one another, tender hearted. Are you kind to people? To all people? God's been kind to you, hasn't he? You needed his kindness in your life in order that you might be saved. And so out of that and recognising that kindness shown to you, we should be kind to others. In the same way, when we recognise the forgiveness given to us by God, we should also then forgive others. Now, look, I've gone very quickly through these verses and some of them maybe need explanation. Some of it need very little. But at the end of it, I suppose we're kind of left with this list thinking, how am I going to do this? I'm surely going to fall short. Is it even possible? And the danger, if we start to think that way as well, it would be nice to be able to try and do this, but there's no chance. So. In fact, we barely even try. But I'm reminded of what it says in James. We need to be not merely hearers of the word, but doers of the word. The truth is that it is possible for us to be changed by God. Generosity and truthfulness, and speech that builds people up is possible. And that's because God is a decisive factor, not you. He will make us to be who he wants us to be. It doesn't say if you can be tender hearted. Neither does it say as long as life's not been difficult, then be tender hearted. It says we are to do it. And we read, moving into the next chapter, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. We are to be imitators of God as beloved children. This is who you are now. And because this is who you are, this is your new identity. Well, what we've considered today is how in fact we are to live. And you are loved by God. That is the power which enables us to be imitators of God. Be imitators of God as beloved children. Because he loves you. Because Christ has loved you. Because your identity is as his child. Then we should imitate him. Putting off the old self. Putting on the new. 